Okay, we are connected. Good evening, viewers. We welcome our viewers again to this sixth session on decoding the conclusion of the Bhagavad Gita. Our speaker, uh, Sri Pratik Desai ji, continues to speak on this uh, very, uh, uh, very intriguing topic, and he is he's besides being a uh, having his masters in aeronautical engineering, he's also a scholar. And he's done deep studies on uh, Sanatan Dharma from the Vaishnava uh, Sampraday perspective uh, with uh, the basis of scriptures, the holy, uh, the holy Vaishnava scriptures. So he is dedicating his, uh, he has dedicated his uh, life now for a couple of years to uh, decoding the, the subtle meanings and the deeper giving in deeper insights into the subject. So this sixth session on decoding the uh, decoding the conclusions of Bhagavad Gita. So Pratikji, over to you to continue the session. Okay, thank you so much Rajivji for conducting uh, these uh, sessions on uh, decoding the final conclusion of Gita. Very important and uh, I think helpful to the community at large. And uh, especially when uh, in today's day and age, we have uh, more than 500 interpretation of the Bhagavad Gita. So it's very difficult to come to the right conclusion. So all these sessions, I believe and I hope that uh, it will be useful for the audience. And they'll be able to understand uh, what we have explained is in a very systematic and uh, in a simple language. So I hope uh, the audience will uh, be able to connect with it. And uh, just wanted to add that we have already conducted five sessions about uh, decoding final conclusion of Gita because uh, there are several facts that needs to be established and brought in the forefront of the Bhagavad Gita because these are all the facts as they are and uh, it is necessary for them to be uh, conveyed to the audience without any confusion. So I will just uh, brief up the different uh, topics that we have established in this uh, particular session. The first, we started with the eligibility to comment on the Gita and the multiple paths that the Gita shares. So what are the multiple paths and how to understand those paths, those different paths in context to the ultimate path. Then second session we covered is demigod worship proper and why yoga is interpreted as bhakti yoga. Then third is bhakti not only awards results of all the parts, but a lot more. Then fourth session, how Krishna's supreme position is self-evidently established or revealed in the Bhagavad Gita. And then find uh, the fifth one is the absolute dependence of all other paths on bhakti. So I request the viewers and the audience to, if they have missed any of these sessions and uh, please go through it. Because these are frequently asked questions by the audience about uh, why the Bhagavad Gita or especially why Srila Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita and why ISKCON as such, they promote bhakti as a topmost and only bhakti, they give emphasis to bhakti and why not karma, jnana, jnana. Uh, so then obviously the position of the demigods, why only Krishna is uh, being portrayed as a supreme. So all such questions are very relevant and useful and uh, that's why they are very important to share. In today's session, what we'll be doing is, uh, we'll be going through the non-devotional yoga processes and we will also observe and see how these non-devotional yoga processes, they, so last session we established that all the other paths, they are absolutely dependent on bhakti in order to achieve their goal that we have established. So in this session, we are going to see what are the results that we attain 
by all devotional yoga practices um and uh, the liberation corresponding liberation in non devotional practices okay okay um <clears throat> so see one can clearly understand from the process of self realization that we are not the body we are the spirit soul i think this is a common theme that is accepted by all philosophers or all spiritual paths so this body is the gross body the external body that we see is the gross body and then beyond the gross body inside is the subtle body so subtle body is something that we cannot see with our gross eyes but the subtle body is composed of mind intelligence and ego and the gross body is made up of the material elements like earth water fire air ether the mind intelligence ego these are the subtle elements and they compose the subtle body <clears throat> and then beyond the subtle body the soul is the one which is actually pervading consciousness throughout the body so we feel something it that's the only because of soul because a dead body cannot feel anything matter cannot feel anything because matter is dead it is dull so matter cannot experience pain pleasure anything pain pleasure is only experienced by the soul now in one way the soul is transcendental to the material elements but because the soul identifies itself with the gross body um that's why in connection with that it experiences pain and pleasure otherwise the soul being a part and parcel of the supreme god it is not i mean it is it does not experience anything especially related to the material body and to the material pleasures and pain right so that's why the soul is the as the lord is sachidananda vigraha swaru so similarly the soul is also sachidananda uh, it is made up of eternal knowledge and bliss so that's the constitutional position of the soul and now what we are going to see is that how these different devotional or non devotional practices or yoga they give results corresponding to the body to the material elements not exactly to the soul okay so that we are going to see <clears throat> so the topics are going to be about the body mind intelligence and the soul so body is basically the external body and mind intelligence soul so mind and intelligence they are they basically belong to the subtle body and then the soul so the different yoga system they relate to the emphasis which is placed on these four elements as vehicles for self realization okay now Uh, so what needs to be shown here is karma yoga is that process which places emphasis on the body as a vehicle for self realization so it's a body is going to be in karma yoga the body is going to be an instrument for realizing the self then in gyana yoga the mind is going to be the instrument to realize the self and uh yoga basically dhyan yoga the intellect and then bhakti so bhakti so for dhyan yoga the intellect is going to be the uh, instrument and for bhakti the soul is the instrument okay okay so let me start with chapter 9 sorry i am sorry uh, chapter 3 42 verse so i'll like to share the words so this is about karma yoga so we are referring to the chapter of karma yoga verse number 42 okay इंद्रियाणी परांद्रिभ्य पर मन मनसस्तु परा बुद्धि यो बुद्धे पर तस्तु सा सिनोनिम्स इंद्रियाणी सेंसेस परानी सुपीरियर अहु आर सेड इंद्रियेभ्य मोर देन द सेंसेस परम सुपीरियर मन द माइंड 
manasa more than the mind to also para superior buddhi intelligence yo who buddhi more than intelligence parata superior to but so he <coughs> so the working senses are superior to dull matter <coughs> mind is higher than the senses intelligence is still higher than the mind and the soul is even higher than the intelligence so this is the meaning of the particular shloka so the levels of material elements they can be understood to be categorized according to their degrees of subtleness or increasing connection with the spirit and decreasing connection with matter so here we can clearly see uh, this hierarchy has been defined by krishna and he says that the working senses are superior to dull matter obviously that we understand mind is higher than the senses that also we understand because the mind is the one which uh, controls the senses and then mind is controlled by the intelligence so intelligence using intelligence we can direct the mind so that way intelligence becomes higher than the mind and finally the soul because the soul without the soul nothing is going to exist and nothing is going to function so the soul is going to be the highest right so now we see this that the body is far most from the soul then after the body mind intelligence and finally the soul so intelligence is closest to the soul and then mind uh, and body they are further away from the soul so in that sense it's mentioned that in their increasing connection with spirit and decreasing connection with matter so intelligence is more close with spirit and mind is more close to the uh, body is more close to the matter okay so words now we'll go to words number 3.7 <clears throat> yastva indriyani manasa niyama niyam yar vate arjuna karmendriya karma yogam asakta sa vishishyate synonyms ya one who to but indriyani the senses manasa by the mind niyamya regulating arabhate begins arjun or arjun karma indriya by the active sense organs karma yoga devotion asakta without attachment so he sishyate is far is by far the better translation on the other hand if a sincere person tries to control the active senses by the mind and begins karma yoga in krishna consciousness without attachment he is by far superior <clears throat> so the repeated emphasis here is on the word indriya meaning senses so in the previous verse a practitioner who engages his senses but not his mind is condemned by krishna so difference with the example in this verse is that the senses are under the control of mind however the instrument which is emphasized is instrumental for success in karma yoga are the senses so this is repeated mainly throughout the third and the fifth chapter of the gita so one meaning of karma can be physical work karma yoga means work done with body as a means for liberation so whatever you do with your body it can be the means for liberation the instrument for liberation now we will see about gyan yoga so this is fifth chapter 13th verse सर्वकर्माणि मनसा सन्यासस्ते सुखं वसि नवाद्वारे पुरे देहि नैव कुर्वन् नकारयन् सिनोनिम्स सर्व ऑल कर्माणि एक्टिविटीज मनसा बाय द माइंड सन्यास्य गिविंग अप आस्ते रिमेन सुखं इन हैप्पीनेस वसि वन हु इज कंट्रोल्ड नवाद्वारे इन द प्लेस वेयर देयर आर नाइन गेट्स पुरे इन द सिटी देहि द एम्बेडेड सोल ना नेवर एवर सडनली कुर्वन डूइंग एनीथिंग ना नॉट karayan causing to be done translation when the embodied living being controls his nature and mentally renounces all action he resides happily in the city of nine gate the material body neither working nor causing work to be done 
So the emphasis in this verse is upon the use of the mind in achieving renunciation and freedom from work and its reactions. There are other verses such as 15, uh, sorry, 5th chapter 19 verse, which confirm the same understanding. Thus for the jnani, the purified mind is the prime instrument for self-realization. Now coming to Ashtanga. So in the same chapter, 5th chapter, 27 to 28. Sparsham Kritva Vahil Bhamyam Chakshus Chaivantare Bruho Rana Pano Samo Kritva Nasavyantara Charino Patendriya Manobuddhi Munir Moksha Parayana Vidat Techa Bhaya Kroda Yasara Mukta Evasa So Sparsham sense objects such as sound, Kritva keeping by external. By an unnecessary chakshu eyes cha also ever suddenly antare between through the eyebrows prana upon up and down going air somehow in suspension kritva keeping nasa abhyantara within the nostrils charino blowing yata controlled indriya senses mana mind buddhi intelligence muni the transcendentalist moksha for liberation parayana being so destined vigata having discarded ichha wishes bhai fear Road, anger, yeah, one who Sada always mukta liberated, Eva certainly, sir, he is shutting out all external sense objects, keeping the eyes and vision concentrated between the two eyebrows, suspending the inward and outward breaths within the nostrils, and thus controlling the mind, senses, and intelligence. The transcendentalist aiming at liberation becomes free from desire. Fear and anger. One who is always in this state is suddenly liberated. Yeah. So these verses of summary description indicates that this process compromises Yatindriya Mano Buddhir or control of senses, mind, and intelligence. From the aforementioned quote at the end of third chapter. So one would automatically conclude that in order to bring the mind into control. The intelligence, which is a higher order medium, must be engaged. So, chapter while chapter six emphasizes the need for controlling mind, it is repeatedly mentioned that this is possible by the use of intelligence, which is described in chapter six, 21, 25, 26 verses. So, in 6.25, Krishna states, uh, okay, one second, 6.25. Pranesanir Uparam Mede Uparam Mede Buddha Driti Gritaya Atma Samstam Manakritva Nakinchad of Pichintayet Pane gradually Shane step by step Uparam Mede one should hold back Buddha by intelligence Driti Gritaya carried by conviction Atma Samstam placed in transcendence Mana mind Kritva making Na not Kinchad anything else Api even Chintayet should think of. Gradually, step by step, one should become situated in trance by means of intelligence. So it's sustained by full conviction, and thus the mind should be fixed on the self alone and should think of nothing else. So the verse above is quite conclusive in confirming that for Ashtang Yog, the instrument of liberation is considered to be the intelligence. So this, this we can clearly understand from logic as well as from the verses of the Bhagavad Gita. Now coming to Bhakti Yoga. So now there are many quotes that substantiate the uh, that the soul is actually the means for engagement in devotional service. In the end of the chapter 6, Krishna says Mad Gartir Antar Atmana Shaddhavam Bhajate Maam. The word Bhajate has been shown earlier in our sessions we have shown that this is actually meant Bhakti Yoga. Okay. Now uh, so the interesting word here used is anta atmana. The word atmana has multiple interpretations. It means the self. According to 
the identification it has it may refer to the body it may refer to mind it may refer to intelligence or the soul but here the word antes is significant literally the word translates as innermost self let me show that words also Okay, so this is the verse number forty-seven. Yogi nama api sarve sham mad gate antar atmana shraddhavan baje peyo mam sene yukto tamo mata. Yogi nama of yogis api also sarve sham of all types, all types of mad gate na abiding in me, always thinking of me. Anta atmana within himself, shraddhavan in full faith. Baje te renders transcendental nature this. Ya yeah, one who mam to me, so he me. He may by me, Ujjwala Tama, the greatest yogi, Mata is considered. And of all the yogis, the one with great faith, who always abides in me, thinks of me within himself, and renders transcendental loving service to me, he is the most intimately united with me in yoga, and is the highest of all. That is my opinion. Okay, so the word is the word anta is very significant because. it refers to the innermost self atma can refer to body mind intelligence and soul but anta atma means the innermost self and that can only refer to the soul <clears throat> considering the different selves that have been discussed until now in the gita the innermost self can only refer to the soul because there is nothing beyond that and some other verses also confirm the same conclusion which is 9th chapter 34th verse and 12th chapter 8th verse thus it is confirmed that for bhakti yoga the instrument for liberation is the engagement of the soul so this we have understood that these are the different different instruments for karma jnana dhyana and bhakti yoga okay so now will any any questions or comments uh, no problem ji i think we are doing fine okay so we have already covered about the instruments in different yogas now we will cover about the liberation in non devotional practices in, the, in these different types of uh, yogas So in chapter nine, two processes were cited as evidence that only bhakti avoids ultimate liberation. Of the two, one was confirmed based on statement of Lord Krishna in fourth chapter, thirtieth verse, and he states that the practice of non-devotional yoga allows the practitioner to advance towards the supreme destination. So now we'll. Uh, analyze each yoga practice by referring to the verses of gita and then from those verses we shall show that the liberation awarded by non devotional practices is subordinate to that awarded by bhakti and then the obvious implication is that bhakti is superior to all other yoga types okay so karma yoga what is the goal what we achieve what liberation we achieve in karma yoga so what is the result that we achieve in karma yoga so we will refer to the verse number 3.19 tasmad asakta satadam karyam karma samachara asakto hi acharan karma param apnoti purusha synonyms Tasman therefore asakta without attachment, satadam constantly, karya means duty, karma work, samachar 
perform asakta and attached he certainly acharan performing karma work param the supreme apnoti achieves purusha or man therefore without being attached to the fruits of activities one should act as a matter of duty for by working without attachment one attains the supreme so this was it concisely defines karma yoga as working without attachment to the fruits of action and such obligatory work is also known as duty and the result of such work is param apnoti or attaining the supreme now what supreme does krishna refer to here the following verse explains this attainment as perfection or siddhim however there is no indication in either verse 19 or 20 of either the nature of that supreme or the nature of that perfection and so verse number 31 which is summary of the karma yoga process and its result thus shed light on this question so we will go through verse number 20 and then we we'll go to verse number 30 31 कर्मण ही संसिधि आस्थित जनकादया लोक संग्रह संपश्यन कर्तम आरसी कर्मण बै वर्क इवन ही सटनली संसिधि इन परफेक्शन आस्थित सिचुएटेड जनक आदाय जनक एंड अदर किंग्स लोक संग्रह पीपल इन जनरल एव अपी आलसो संपश्यन कंसिडरिंग कर्तम टू एक्ट आरसी इन रिजर्व किंग्स सच एज जनक अटेंड perfection solely by performance of prescribed duties therefore just for the sake of educating the people in general you should perform your work and now we go to verse number 31 yemam matam idam nityam anutistanti manava shraddhavanto nasuyanto uchchante api karma vi ye dosu my matam injunctions idam these nityam as an internal function anutistanti execute regularly manava human being shraddha vanta with faith and devotion anasu yanta without envy mutchante become free te all of them api even karma bhi from the bondage of the law of fruitive actions those person who execute their duties according to my injunctions and who follow this teaching faithfully without envy become free from the bondage of fruitive actions so krishna clarifies the nature of this liberation by the words nichante te api karma bhi this means becoming free from the bondage of fruitive actions thus the liberation perfection or the supreme achieved by karma yoga is to be free from reaction to one's work so this is how we analyze that although there is mention about attaining the supreme but that supreme is actually defined as the means to achieve or the uh, result that one attains is basically to get rid from the reaction of uh, our karma of fruitive actions by unregulated activity one becomes disentangled uh sorry one becomes entangled in material existence and by regulated work one is liberated from such entanglement so this may be a good platform from which to practice spiritual life but in and of itself it does not constitute ultimate perfection of liberation So karma yoga does not result in ultimate liberation, but rather freedom from the result of fruitful action. So this is what we had discussed in one of the previous sessions also that karma yoga actually the goal that one attains is to get rid of karma basically. That's the only goal that we can attain, but not beyond that. Then let's analyze gyan yoga. What is the liberation that we achieve through gyan yoga? So in the 18th chapter verses. 49 to 55 describe the different stages of perfection for the gyani in verse 18.49 self control and detachment or freedom from reactions by karma yoga 
by further purification and detachment one comes to the level of brahman which is explained in verse says 52 of 18th chapter this liberation is known as <clears throat> brahma bhuta and precedes entrance into devotional service and then uh, there is a verse number 54 which is a popular verse says brahma bhuta prasanatma na sochti na kamshati sama sarveshu bhuteshu mad bhaktim labate param one who is transcendentally situated at once realizes the supreme brahman and becomes fully joyful he never laments or desires to have anything he is equally disposed towards living entity and in that state he attains pure devotional service unto him the process by which a gyani comes to devotional service is also described in seven chapter 19 verse as being a continuum achieved through many lifetimes of effort bahuna janmana mante gyanva mam prabhadyate the siddhi mentioned in verses 50 to 53 of 18 chapter is reaching the brahma bhuta stage which is the consciousness of being brahman or spirit at this stage one is free from the influence of modes of material nature liberation in brahman has been mentioned in the end of the 14th chapter brahmano hi pratishtaham amritasya vayasya cha shashvata sacha dharmasya sukha yai kantasya cha so i am that basis of impersonal brahman which is immortal imperishable and eternal and is the constitutional position of ultimate happiness 14 chapter 27th verse so liberation for a gyani who has not come to devotional service will at the most be elevation to the brahman platform which may culminate in entrance into the brahma jyoti with the word association according to verse number 18.54 this is the platform at which devotional service really begins right so verse number 54 clearly establishes when does bhakti begin bhakti begins once you reach the stage of brahma bhuta so that means bhakti is beyond that now we'll come to ashtanga yoga okay so the situation of the dhyan yogis is described in the sixth chapter of bhagavad gita the lord states 6.28 okay let me show the verse <clears throat> युंजन एवं सदात्मानं योगी विगत कल्मस सुखेन ब्रह्म संस्पर्शं अत्यंतं सुखं अस्तुते युंजन एंगेजिंग इन योगा प्रैक्टिस एवं दस सदा ऑलवेज आत्मानं द सेल्फ योगी वन हु इज इन टच विद द सुप्रीम सेल्फ विगत फ्रीड फ्रॉम कल्मस ऑल मटेरियल कंटामिनेशन सुखेन इन ट्रांसेंडेंटल हैप्पीनेस ब्रह्म संस्पर्शं बीइंग इन कांस्टेंट टच विद द सुप्रीम अत्यंतम दाये सुखम हैप्पीनेस अस्तुदे अटेंस कंफ्लेशन दस द सेल्फ कंट्रोल योगी कांस्टेंटली एंगेज इन योगा प्रैक्टिस बिकम्स फ्री फ्रॉम ऑल मटेरियल कंटामिनेशन एंड अचीव द हाईएस्ट स्टेज ऑफ परफेक्ट हैप्पीनेस इन ट्रांसेंडेंटल लविंग सर्विस टू द लॉर्ड and then there is the next verse verse 29 sarva bhutastham atmanam sarva bhutani cha atmani ikshate yoga yuktatma sarvatra samadarshana sarva bhuta stham situated in all beings atmanam the super soul sarva all bhutani entities cha also atmani the self ikshate dasi yoga yukta atma one who is doubted in krishna consciousness sarvatra everywhere sama darshana seeing equally a true yogi observes me in all beings and also sees every being in me indeed the self realized person sees me the same supreme lord everywhere okay 
So, Pratik ji, uh, doesn't it appear that uh, as compared to Karma Yoga, the path of Karma Yoga, where you're only getting freedom from futile actions, here you're getting much closer to the Supreme uh, Brahman, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. In Ashtang, in, in the practice yeah. of yoga, yeah, of course, because as we already discussed in the previous topic that uh, which, which are the instruments to attain self-realization. So for right. Ashtanga Yoga, intelligence is the instrument for attaining this. Um, which is, high, supreme, which is higher than the strength. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So, and then we also mentioned that the intelligence is closest to the soul and body is farthest, the, the farthest from the soul. Um, so that way, you can see that body is more close to matter and intelligence is more close to spirit. That's why Ashtanga Yoga also is more closely connected to the spiritual reality. So here, basically, it is uh, to be in touch with the super soul or to be one with the super soul. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Okay, so 29, this is 29 verse we read from 6th chapter. So see, in verse 68, the perfection state is described as Brahma Samsparsha or being in constant touch with the Supreme. An example of such constant association is given in the following verse 29, that the vision described of a devoted yogi is that he sees the Lord situated in everyone's heart as the super soul. So such liberation constitutes an awareness of oneself as part and parcel of the Supreme. So this is the fundamental difference between Jnani and Ashtanga Yogi. So Ashtanga Yogi is basically able to perceive that he is part and parcel of the Supreme and the Supreme is present everywhere. Whereas the Jnani, he is always thinking that he is one with the Supreme. So the uh, so small difference between the realization of Jnani and Ashtanga Yogi. Um, so, such liberation constitutes an awareness of oneself as part and parcel of Supreme. Another example is the vision of an Ashtanga Yogi who has no devotional association. So, the followers of Patanjali, they fall into this category. For them, liberation as described here and in verse 6.32 is to merge into the body of the super soul. This practice is similar to the Jnani who desires to merge into the existence of Brahman. So, this is the difference. They merge in Brahman, they merge in Super Soul, Jnani and Ashtanga Yogi. All right. So now we uh, come to the conclu concluding uh, section. So the conclusion from the above exercise is that liberation in non-devotional practice is always subordinate to liberation in Bhakti Yoga. For the Karma Yogi, it is freedom from reaction. For the Jnani, it is liberation in Brahman. And for the Ashtanga Yogi, it is contact with or merging in to the Supreme, uh, the Super Soul. So this may be compared to the liberation in Bhakti, which about which Krishna states in 18.56 verse. Though engaged in all kinds of activities, my devotee under my protection, which is the eternal imperishable abode by my grace. The attainment of Krishna's abode simultaneously includes the liberations awarded in other non-devotional yoga practices also and more, uh, which we have already covered in one session. Uh, Bhakti, um, we receive much more, not just um, whatever other yogas they achieve, but Bhakti, through the means of Bhakti, we can achieve much more. The attainment of Krishna's abode, okay. Um, by the association of a devotee, all kinds of yogis may take up devotional service and achieve its result. This may be done while they are still practicing the disciplines or they may abandon those practices to take up bhakti exclusively. All right, so we can conclude this uh, section about uh, the different types of liberation which is achieved by the non-devotional yoga practices. Any question or comment? Would this uh, Ashtang yoga still be considered non-devotional? Because uh, 
as in uh, the verse earlier, it uh, in 6.28, it confirms that the uh, self-controlled yogi constantly engaged in yoga practice becomes free from all material contamination and achieves the highest stage of perfect happiness in transcendental loving service to the Lord. So then this is yeah. this is God devotion, na? No, actually, see, this is how Srila Prabhupada has uh, interpreted the translation. So he has oh. connected to the transcendental loving service, but the verse only mentions about yoga yukta atma. <laughs> okay, so basically, uh, see, there are different ways to see yoga system. Ultimately, one can see all the practices as um, Bhakti Yoga. They can connect everything with Bhakti Yoga. For example, let's take Karma Yoga, Dhyana Yoga, Ashtanga Yoga. I mean, Karma, Jnana and Dhyana. And these things can also become Bhakti Yoga. So how they can become Bhakti? It's very simple. When you do Karma with your body, you do it for the pleasure of the Lord. You engage yourself in the physical activity in the service of Lord. So whatever, not just the bondage from, uh, you get free from the bondage of putative actions, but then when you engage everything in the service of Lord, then you also attain bhakti for the Lord. Your uh, attachment to the Lord increases through karma yoga. So karma can be used as an instrument for doing devotional service also. So that's why a devotee sees differently because devotee realizes that Body, mind, intelligence, everything can be used and channelized in the service of Lord. And they are all created by the Lord for the service of Lord. So they don't, they don't reject it. They don't um, misuse that. They engage everything. This is called Yukta Vairagya. So Vairagya is mean, uh, meaning renunciation. But Yukta means to connect that renunciation in a positive way. So a devotee realizes that everything is uh, created by the Lord. And that's why it has to be engaged in the service of God. Right? Because the owner is the Lord. So it has it should belong to the Lord. So it should be engaged in the service of God. So karma can be done like that. Similarly, uh, jnana. So inquiring about the absolute truth, inquiring about the Supreme Lord. When it is done for attaining devotional service to the Lord, then it becomes jnana yoga, which is in channelized in the service of Lord. And then finally, we have the Ashtanga Yoga. So where now, I think your question is about the Ashtanga Yoga part. So here, Dhyana, meditation, can be channelized for uh, meditating on the forms of the Lord, on the pastime of the Lord, on the service of the Lord. Nam, Rup, Guna, Leela, like that. So that becomes, again, channelized in the service of God. So that's why Prabhupada says that Yoga Yuktatma means engage in transcendental service of the Lord. Because... Ultimately, as we have discussed in the previous sessions, that um, the result, the highest result, and the purpose of other parts, these are all described in Bhagavad Gita. So, the Lord wants, ultimately, the Lord wants that one surrenders to Him in devotional service. That is the conclusion of Bhagavad Gita. This is what we have established in our previous sessions. So, so now see, that's why we have to connect all these sessions together. Then it makes sense. Why but sometimes where karma is mentioned, where dhyana is mentioned, why Prabhupada is translated as bhakti yoga or in the loving service of Lord. Now it makes sense. Because what, what are the individual results of all these paths? What do you achieve by following these paths? It is incomplete. It is inferior to what is achieved by bhakti yoga. Because bhakti yoga includes everything. And not just including the results of all, but more, much more than that. That also we established. So whichever yoga, whichever path you follow, it should be, finally it should lead you to bhakti yoga. Because that path will remain incomplete. You will not be able to attain full liberation. So there's an impartial, impartial liberation you can say like that. Right? So that's why the goal of Krishna is finally to connect like, you know, it's a step-by-step -step gradual process. If a child cannot climb the stairs, then he has to take a step, 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 and then finally reach some height. 
So similarly, knowing our consciousness, knowing our conditioning, knowing our limitations, our tendency of uh, uh, being influenced by the modes of material nature, the Lord gives multiple paths to attract us and at the same time to also tell us that, okay, do it, but then there is something more than this. So finally come to that point. Like that. So this is how everything is connected. That's why the, the entire purpose of this uh, these sessions is to establish the point. Because there are many scholarly people who claim that uh, Prabhupada's translation is very biased towards bhakti. Everything is connected to bhakti ultimately. Even jnana, karma and jnana is connected to bhakti. So this is the purpose of that. Um, why he is doing that? This is what we have learned from all these sessions till now. Right? Yes, yes. Okay. So let us now conclude with a small section about how the Gita is to be considered as good as Veda. And that also is according to the Gita. So the Gita as Veda is according to Gita. That we will see now. The small section. Um, and maybe I believe that this may be the last session of this series on decoding the final conclusion of Gita. I have to see maybe if there is um, one or two topics remaining or this is the conclusion. But we'll establish now how the Gita, because see, we started assuming, we started from the point of assuming that the Gita is the topmost authority or equal to the um, Vedic scriptures. It is as good as the Vedic scripture and um, it gives the ultimate conclusion. That's why we are reading the Gita, we are analyzing and we are decoding the conclusion of Gita. If there was a superior scripture, then we would have not even touched Gita. So now we'll see how Gita is as good as Veda from the point of view of the Bhagavad Gita. So see, um, so there are some scholars who do not agree Bhagavad Gita is part of the Vedas. Okay, and they also disagree on the authorship of the entire Vedas. But in 18.75, 18th chapter 75th verse, it is clear that Sanjay heard the Gita by the mercy of Vyasdev. So he says, Vyasa Prasadash Sutavan Etad Duryam Aham Param Yogam Yogeshwara Krishna Sakshat Kathayaka Swayam. So, by the mercy of Vyas, I have heard these most confidential talks directly from the master of all mysticism, Krishna, who was speaking personally to Arjun. So, if Sanjay received the Gita by the mercy of Vyasdev, then Vyasdev must certainly have heard and understood the Gita. That is common sense. And if he is not accepted as the author, it is irrefutable that he was involved with the transmission of the same. So if one then is seeking to find the author of Gita, Yas is certainly one sage who should be given first consideration. So in 13th chapter 5th verse, Krishna states that he is about to speak the topic described in the Vedas and Vedanta. Rishivir Mahudagitam Chandrovir Vivida Prithak Brahma Sutra Padashchaiva Hetanu Tanudbir Vinishtite. That knowledge of the field of activities and nor of activities is described by various sages in various Vedic writings. It is especially present in Vedanta Sutra with all reasoning as to the cause and effect. So, this verse makes it clear that the topic of chapter 13 reflects the content of the Vedas. In the same way, the content of every chapter is Vedic. But does the Gita fit into Vedic tradition and the Vedic period? So then we should ask this question, what qualifies as Vedas? So there are different opinions among empiricists and even transcendentalists. Verse 15 from 15 chapter has been quoted earlier. <clears throat> and the same verse can be now quoted that Sarvastha cham rizis anivishtam mataspitir gyanam aponam cha vedascha sarvar am avavedya vedanta kvid vedavit eva cham. So by, I, I will just uh, share the translation on the last two lines. 
by all the vedas i am to be known indeed i am the compiler of vedanta and i am the knower of the vedas so this one clearly answers the questions at hand <clears throat> first of all krishna establishes that he is the knower of the vedas that includes its history the purpose the philosophy everything and as such he states that the goal of vedas is to know him this is a basic definition of the vedas those scriptures which teach one to know krishna this is not the goal of some of the vedas but all of them as he says conversely that writing which has its purpose knowing krishna is also veda and gita is certainly such a text so it is very clearly established by krishna that the purpose of the vedic knowledge is to understand him to know him and so that's why <clears throat> whichever scripture describes about krishna makes us understand and realize krishna that is itself as good as the veda so the gita is the one scripture which definitely does that it talks about krishna and that's why it is definitely vedic in nature so now the next point it relates to the opening paragraph discussing the authorship of the vedas now krishna says he is the compiler of vedanta in the 10th chapter also he states that among sages is vyasa so taking these three facts into account we can um there are there are three facts okay vyas was the medium for sanjay giving the gita among sages krishna is vyas krishna is the compiler of vedanta there is no record or indication that krishna had directly written the vedas so this has never been presented as an argument by anyone but vyas is a sage with whom vedic writing are always associated and krishna says that he is a compiler of vedanta so this leaves every indication that such authorship is via the medium of shila vyas dev since vedanta explains the vedas it would be reasonable to assume that the authors are the same this lends to even stronger argument that vyas dev being the author of the gita so in conclusion the gita according to krishna's authority is certainly veda and vyasa is most reasonable candidate as its author all right so we have concluded that now any any questions or comments on this i <clears> know <throat> uh, pati yeah so it's very i mean surprising that people they even claim some of them even think and claim that uh, vyasdev is not the original author of the vedas <laughs> that's like maybe on the extreme side we have never heard this kind of argument but uh, yeah but it's all logical you know like uh, krishna is establishing the authority of vedas the purpose of vedas and then krishna says i am the sage among i am vyasa among the sages and then he is also says that i am the compiler of the vedas so everything is so connected to each other so there are all the verses uh, are directly self evidently present in uh, bhagavad gita we just have to somehow use our intelligence and uh, locate these verses and uh, it's very important to present it to the audience then they can realize that there is nothing bias in this if there is a conclusion which makes more sense than this then kindly present that conclusion but uh, does not make sense to say that uh, uh, that the ultimate truth is uh, impersonal or there are alternatives different paths and uh, yeah i mean these are all sanctioned by the lord but he has also established which is the most superior path people even say sometimes you know that uh, is called devotees or the hari krishna they are always after uh, proving their path is superior or krishna is superior and they have all such claims but it is not uh, you know a biased opinion it is a matter of uh, logical understanding common sense and uh, realization even in our material world also we see um, it's not biased to say that uh, let's say gautam adani is the richest person in india currently or uh, virat kohli is the best batsman in india currently it it is so why do we say that because these are observable facts we see and we see that it's all true um 
everything is seen live. There's record of everything. So similarly, there are um, records of the forms of the Lord, the processes of the different parts and processes, the results that one achieves by this process, the ultimate goal, and what is what it means to say that what is the ultimate reality, truth, or liberation. So when we understand these things, then we truly understand everything. And we can appreciate the hierarchy also. Because hierarchy is always going to be there. And uh, otherwise one can say that, well, everything is one. All devtas, all forms of the Lord, they are all one. If they are all one, why does it need to have so many forms? You can just have one form because then otherwise they contradict the principle that uh, one form is limited, unlimited. I mean, you know, then they restrict that one form. So to say that we require many forms is to basically contradict the thing that the Supreme has is, is unlimited to, to contradict that thing. But if the Supreme is truly unlimited, he does not require any such other forms. And then we understand that these other forms, they are all his expansions. And it's only meant for the pleasure of the Lord. And then we understand the hierarchy. So, you know, it's the same thing in the material world also. It's not that everything is one. <laughs> That's a ridiculous uh, conclusion. So anyways, uh, yeah, Rajiv, do you have any final uh, comments or questions? Uh, the thing is that uh, right in the first verse, I think that was a very good start that we have established the hierarchy of the instruments, starting yeah. from your senses and the highest being the soul. So that actually, I think, sets the uh, uh, very clearly. It gives you the direction that where yeah, instrument yeah. the highest instrument is soul. So obviously, bhakti has to be the best, the topmost part. I yeah. Think uh -huh. and, and similar to this, if you remember, we also established how Krishna is the, the supreme absolute truth. You know, we started with saying that Brahman is in different different forms. So it's a Mahatattva, the material nature. The Jiva is also referred to Brahman. The supreme supreme the the super soul is also referred to as Brahman, and Krishna is also referred to as Brahman. And then we establish that uh, if we analyze that. There is also some hierarchy, or uh, because um, further the Gita verses they say that uh, <clears throat> Jiva is superior to Del Matter, a Super Soul is superior to Jiva, right? And then Brahman is superior to um, the Jiva, the Super Soul is superior to Brahman, and then Krishna is superior to because he is sustaining all these things. So that's how Krishna is in the hierarchy in the, in the supreme most so it's a similar kind of uh, analysis that we have used here also whichever is very close to spirit and which is further away from spirit so similarly right. brahman also if everything is one then there's no point of having this hierarchy then what is the meaning of the hierarchy that krishna is also talking about so that's why we understand that everything is different they are all at different different levels. So very uh, systematically. So right. So Lord has his various aspects which are non-different from Lord, but there is a hierarchy with it. Exactly. I mean, this is what we are saying. You know that everything exists. It's not that uh, we reject Brahman or we reject anything else. Everything exists simultaneously, but it is one and different. I mean, it's not so difficult to understand because we are like sun rays, we are also qualitatively the same, but quantity wise, we are different. Because oneness, if you talk on, about oneness, then it will not answer many of the questions. It will not justify why we suffer in the material world, why, where are we coming from, how do, how do we get affected at some point of time? I mean, if everything is one, there is no question of asking also how we get affected because everything is one. So it will not answer any questions. But whatever you have, 
observable in the material world that is uh, very much closely connected to the accepting the supreme aspect of the lord personality it is very right. similar to that so it will make sense more right correct right. <clears throat> yeah I, okay. I may just have to leave uh, to think because my uh, digital is expected now. Yeah, sure. So we can, anyways, we have we have uh, finished our uh, conclusion, and uh, so let let's see. Maybe I think this may be the last session, or uh, if there's something else to be discussed, then uh, we may have another session on this series. Otherwise, this may be the last one. Okay, oh. all right. So thank you so much, Ravi, okay. for your uh, kind participation. Oh. And, thank uh, you. Thank you so much. Share the knowledge with others. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.